The Lord be with you. We are so happy that you are joining us here at First Presbyterian Church of Iowa City on this May 2nd, 2021. We, are, we welcome you into our space, which is a PCUSA uh, church in the Eastern Iowa Presbytery. I would like to invite you to sing Be Still and Know with me. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. So join me as we open our hearts and our minds and our souls and our bodies to prepare for worship this morning. Gathered as God's people through the love of Jesus Christ, we accept God's invitation to worship. We gather to praise and worship God, the one who created us for love. We gather to worship this true vine, the one in whose love we abide. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.
praised God, we now turn to a time of corporate confession. The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. O Christ, you are the true vine, and you have made us your branches. In your grace we find strength, and in your love we are set free. Forgive us, O God, when we claim that freedom is only for some and not for all, when we act in ways that enslave those who aren't like us because of skin color, religion, sexuality, or class. Forgive us, O God, when we do not live as people who are your branches, when through our privilege we forget that we are bound to one another by your spirit and rooted in you. Give us courage to grow new branches, relearning old ways so that we can reach out in justice, claiming our resurrection as a call for freedom and for all of your children. Forgive us, O Christ, our one true vine, and teach us to abide in you. Hear the good news of God's promise. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. Jesus, the one we call the Prince of Peace, invites us to live in peace also. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Through prayer, we call on the Holy Spirit to intercede and illumine the reading and proclaiming of the scripture with wisdom and truth. God of love, plant in us your word that we might bear its fruit and glorify your name. Amen. A reading from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Hear the word of God. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip. At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jeru Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Candace is the title given to an Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you are reading? The man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants, because his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him, and they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again. 
but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself in Azotus. He traveled through the area, preaching the good news in all the cities until he reached Caesarea. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. The Gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. He removes any of my branches that do not produce fruit, and he trims any branch that produces fruit so that it will produce even more. You are already trimmed because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. A branch cannot produce fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Likewise, you cannot produce fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you cannot do anything. If you do not remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified 
when you produce much fruit, and this is the way you prove that you are my disciples. Holy wisdom, holy words. She was a first year theological student preparing to become a Presbyterian pastor. And she was invited to preach at a large Presbyterian church in the downtown area. That church had a large sanctuary that fanned out, not in rows, but fanned out like a seashell. And it had a large balcony going the entire width of the sanctuary. But the balcony extended out so far that when one was in the pulpit, you could have the feeling that you could almost reach up and touch somebody sitting in the balcony. On the morning that she preached, she'd stood up to begin her sermon when a man stood up in the middle of the first row in the balcony and he began to scream. His words were not intelligible. She took her hands and placed them on the pulpit and just stood there and watched while no doubt the ushers were in all kinds of anxiety trying to decide what to do. And eventually he finished whatever he was trying to express and sat down. After worship, she was debriefing how her worship leadership had gone and how she felt about the sermon. And somebody said to her, what was that like when the man stood up and started yelling? And she said, I was all right. And she said, somebody said to her, I would have been afraid if I'd been the preacher. And she said, I wasn't afraid. And they said, well, what was it like for you? She said, it was like the kingdom of heaven. And the reason she explained it that way is she said, because in the kingdom of heaven, everybody is welcome. People who seem to be together and people who might seem not to be together. And so she figured that that man needed to say in the church, in God's presence, whatever was on his mind, he did, and she felt good about it. This was an illustration of today's scripture lesson, which says Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. For surely it was her understanding that Jesus was the vine and all people are the branches. Having said that, I would like to ask you this question. Do you know of anyone who is reluctant to acknowledge an injury to themselves or even more likely unwilling to acknowledge an illness or a pain? Do you know anyone who maybe has an injury or an illness who is reluctant to go see a physician? Perhaps you know of someone who can acknowledge their pain and go see a physician, but doesn't want anyone to know. I have no, how, no idea how many people fit into any of these categories, but what I do know is that the people who can acknowledge their hurts, whether it's an injury or an illness, and go get treatment, and then can talk about it, are the ones who are the beneficiaries of the empathy of their friends and their neighbors, are the ones who receive support on their way to recovery. I've told you about physical illness because that's only one of two kinds of illness that we deal with as human beings. The second kind of illness that we deal with is mental health or mental illness. We could also call it emotional illness. Now, someone who is experiencing 
mental illness might not find it easy to acknowledge, to tell anyone about, or to get treatment, or to tell the community to get support. And an illustration will tell you why it might not be so easy. Let's just pretend that you're on a leisurely drive on I-80, you know, going down the road about 55 miles, whoops, I forgot I'm in Iowa, going down the road about 112 miles an hour, and you're in your lane and there's a car in the other lane, not much distance separating you, and there's somebody riding on your fender on the back, and they get upset with you, and they gun it, and they come out and pull beside you, and you don't think there's room for them to go between you and the other car, but they go for it. It strikes you as an absolutely horrible opinion, and you think to yourself, or you say, that is a person. I didn't say the word, but you can figure out one of any kind of words the kind of psychological slang that we do to describe somebody whose behavior is different or that upsets us, as is the case driving down the freeway. One of the problems in acknowledging mental health is that there's a stigma and the use of psychological terms to judge other people makes it difficult for any of us to own our mental health problem. There's another way, though, we can conceive of this. If you were walking down the street, and you were crossing the street and accidentally tripped on the curb and twisted your ankle, people would rush over and pay attention. And if you wound up on crutches temporarily, or in a boot, or with your ankle heavily taped, and you had, were told to stay off of it for a day or two, you would get all kinds of support. But if you have a mental illness, it is not uncommon for people to think, I wonder what you did wrong that you are having these kinds of problems. We don't blame people for physical ailments or injuries, but I think there is not only a stigma about mental illness, there is also a tendency to blame people when they are having emotional or mental illness. There's another way you can see this stigma about mental illness. If you're watching an, oh, I know, a presidential um, speech, and the president happens to get a tear, maybe even cry. How do we describe that? We say about the president, he's being emotional. As if, as if oh my gosh, heavens, he's being emotional. As if there's something wrong. I don't think that's being emotional. I think what that is, is being vulnerable. And I think those are times for us all to treasure. When you're in a conversation with somebody and they've been telling you about something in their lives and they cry, that's not being emotional. That's just saying, I trust you enough that I can be vulnerable. So what then is mental health? And what then is mental illness? Well, there are four elements that I'd like to describe that make up mental health. On the way to describing those, I want you to conceive of a continuum. On this end of the continuum is somebody who is perfectly put together, you know, never ill, never injured, and their um, mental health is perfect. And on this end of the continuum is somebody whose life feels to them and looks to others like a total calamity. 
Now those are the ends of the continuum. Nobody lives on either end. We all live somewhere between those ends. Some people tend to be more physically healthy than others, but that doesn't mean that the others are a wreck. It means they're just maybe to one side of center. The same is true for mental illness. It doesn't, some people are on one side, some are on the other. But both physical and mental illness do not mean that we are here and we're fixed or we're there and we're fixed. The person who sprains their ankle may have been healthy before that, but with the injury and depending how severe it is, they may move to the other side of the continuum. And likewise, when they recover from the injury, they move, may move back to the more healthy side of the continuum. Having said that, here's what mental health and mental illness are. Mental health is the awareness and the ability to manage our emotions. Now, times we don't manage or are having trouble managing our emotions are when we have tiredness, sadness, irritability, no energy for work, blues, blues so severe that we don't have energy to talk with other people, much less to do anything on our daily routine. So mental health tends to be the ability to manage our emotions, to be aware and manage our emotions. When we are not able to do that, we then are on the mental illness side of the continuum. And we in life will probably go back and forth many times. So there are minor times when we might feel really down today, but we feel up and fine tomorrow. But there are times when we feel down for not simply a day, but maybe a week or two weeks. All of that is, is a sign that as we experience those feelings longer and longer, that's an indication that that's a time to ask for help. A second element about what constitutes mental health or mental illness is the ability to have significant relationships. When we have significant relationships, most of us find those to be energizing and fulfilling. But when our relationships run into difficult spots, that's when the relationship suffers and we too suffer. Now this is why the continuum is so important. I don't know anybody who's been in a relationship who hasn't moved from one side to the other and back and forth. The issue becomes when we get stuck, can we ask for help? Another key feature of mental health and then mental illness is being able to recognize when we are stressed and can manage it, and when we're stressed and cannot manage it. A pastor told me about a conference he was at and he was giving a lecture and in the middle of the lecture, a man stood up in the back and he waved his finger at him and yelled at him and he said, Jack, this makes no sense. You're wasting our time. Well, Jack dealt with it and the lecture went on, but that might be an indication of a time when somebody was feeling so much stress that they might have benefited from seeking help. The fourth characteristic of mental health, which is on this end of the continuum, and mental illness, which is on this end of the continuum, is the sense we have about ourselves. If we can go through the day and do the things that we need to do during the day 
and not have to worry about, did I do it right? Am I feeling okay about the way I did it? Am I pleasing everybody? But are able to have a sense, I'm moving through the day, getting things accomplished. I feel good about that. That's mental health. But when we move to the other side, then that's when we might want to seek help. It isn't any fun to live with an ankle sprain, and it is definitely not any fun to live with mental illness. Now, I've said to you that there's a continuum, and the way I've defined the continuum, I think we all have times when we experience mental illness. For some of us, it might be a little teeny bit. For others, it might be a lot. You may have noticed in this sermon that I've talked about Jesus being the vine and we are the branches. Whether we're on this end of the continuum or that end of the continuum, Jesus is still the vine. We are still the branches, not because we're healthy or perfect. We are the branches over here because of God's care and God's love and God's having created us. We are not to blame when we move from one side of the continuum to the other. Just like we're not able to get the credit for remove our, removing our own appendix. You may have noticed in my sermon today that I have not given illustrations. And I've done that on purpose. Let me explain that purpose. When you go to the dentist, if you're like me, I'm not looking forward to that experience when the dentist picks up that little pointy thing in her hand and starts examining my teeth and finds something that shouldn't be there like a cavity. And what does she do? She pokes it and it hurts. Well, she has to. That's part of what needs to be done in her diagnosis and assessment so she can treat. The reason I haven't given an illustration is I don't want to give an illustration that might poke any of the pain that you've experienced in your life, times when you move from this side of the continuum to that side of the continuum. I want to be as tender and caring as I can be because those are, can be excruciatingly painful. So let me give one illustration. It illustrates how we move from one side to the other and we can move back. It shows how Jesus is the vine, but there are other branches around who that can help us. I don't like to talk about myself in sermons, but I can poke my own pain. I don't want to make yours worse. A long time ago, when I was learning how to be a chaplain, the program I was in was a clinical program. That meant we would go in the hospital and make our rounds and see people, and then we would write up the conversations we had about with those people, and we'd bring those into a seminar with the whole group, and we'd get feedback about what we did and what we could do to be a better chaplain. At the time, I was the chaplain <clears throat> assigned to the intensive care unit. Now, this was a long time ago, back before we had lots of intensive care units of different types. And it was a large intensive care unit. And actually, all of us who were chaplains in training thought we were hot stuff when we got assigned to the intensive care unit. So it was my turn to be hot stuff. As you could guess, there were many, many deaths 
that took place in the intensive care unit. And I did my best to, when the patients were conscious, to relate to them and to relate with their families and the staff. One morning, it was my turn to bring in one of my write-ups of my work with a patient, bring it into the seminar. And I walked into the seminar, and I sat down. And I had a copy of what I'd written up for everybody, and I'd circulated all those copies. And I set mine there. And I just sat there. And I sat there and didn't say anything. I didn't know that was going to happen. And the supervisor, the one responsible for all of us rookies, said, Terry. And I went. And we sat there longer. Terry? And then I couldn't help it. I just didn't have a tear. I fell apart. I just cried and cried and cried. And I put my head on the table and I cried and I cried. My colleagues knew what that was about because many of them had worked in that unit. My supervisor, who'd been doing this work for decades, knew what it was about. I didn't know. I didn't know that I had moved from this side of the continuum of good mental health to this side with a mental health problem until I couldn't keep it in anymore. I couldn't identify my own stress. I couldn't talk about my own feelings. And it was not voluntary, but I was vulnerable with everybody else. And when I stopped crying, I said to them, are the deaths ever going to stop? I can't do this anymore. It just hurt so badly. Person next to me put their arm around me. People nodded and I realized, oh, you were here before me. So mental health is when we can know our stress and deal with it. It's when we're aware of our emotions and can manage them. So I had moved over my three or four weeks in the intensive care unit from being just my normal quirky self to being really stuck. But when I was able to be vulnerable, in my case it wasn't voluntary, nobody blamed me for feeling that way. As they explained it to me, there comes a time in life, Terry, when you've got to come to terms with certain realities, and that's what you're doing. And I received their care and support. And it isn't often that you get the privilege of moving from what felt like despair in the direction towards a new balance and wholeness in your life. But that's what happened to me. Jesus is the vine. I'm one of the branches. But on that day, a pretty withered and scrawny and distorted branch. But by the end of the day, they had moved me toward the other side. Mental health is something that we have and that sometimes gets lost. Mental illness is something that we have and often gets better. I'm not going to tell you today what to do for your mental health. You probably have a pretty good idea about many of these things. You could talk with someone in your family. You could talk with a friend. You could talk with the pastor. And as you feel more and more the difficulty of being in touch with your stress or your feelings or with somebody you care about deeply, you might seek out the help of a more highly trained mental health professional. 
all of those resources are for me an affirmation that Jesus intends us to live life abundantly. And while Jesus is the vine and we're the branches, we have all these other resources in the community to help restore our equilibrium. May God bless you in your journey of life. And if you're on this side of the continuum, may God give you courage to say to someone, I could use a talk, or I could use a, a helping hand. Amen. Now we confess our faith. We believe in God, our creator, maker of a universal community still in process. God who provided precious resources to provide for all. God who created us to be connected as companions with God, the earth, and people of every race, class, generation, sexual orientation, gender, and ability. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who was ridiculed, tortured, and executed for the sins of humankind. He rose from the dead, overthrew the dominance of evil and injustice for our sake, and he continues to judge and liberate the hatred, ignorance, and arrogance of human beings. We believe in the way Jesus is our way, our light, and our life. We believe in the Spirit of God, our advocate, whose blaze comforts with divine presence and challenges human hearts to burn for righteousness. We see the power of God in our lives and throughout the world. We trust that God's work through our actions can bring peace. Now we join together in the prayers of the people. God, you brought healing to the people of Israel and you sent Jesus to a ministry of healing. Our world needs healing. Focus the attention and resources of the international community on India and the countries of Latin America and Africa where the virus surges through communities. Where people are afraid to receive vaccination, bless them with the insight and courage to attend to their own health and the health of their community. Create in your people a humble spirit that refuses to categorize others in the hurtful language of psychological slang. God, wherever your story is told, it is a story of your teaching people to trust their lives in your care and to serve others. Bring to the many who have enough a renewed capacity to serve and share with those who struggle day by day on the fringe of existence. God, Jesus told us to love our neighbors as he loved his neighbors by teaching the way of peace. Break down ideological walls that drive nations closer and closer to conflict. Wash away the hurts of previous generations so that historic animosities between communities will transform into new opportunities for mutual cooperation and peace. God, renew a vision of public safety so that people who serve will earn community respect, and those who are served will once again feel secure. 
so transform the inequities of education, health, housing, nutrition, that the day will come when people will walk hand in hand as kin, and the word privilege will receive its long overdue retirement. With the hearts of your people who have come before us, we claim the assurance of your love, praying, our parent who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your realm on earth so that your will can be done here as it is in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us the wrongs that we have done to you as we forgive the wrongs others have done to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the divine realm, the power and the glory. Amen. In the spirit of the first believers, we are called to share our goods in common and to contribute to the needs of the poor. With glad and generous hearts, we offer our lives to God. As those who have been claimed and set free by God's grace, we give thanks through prayer. Faithful God, let these gifts we present to you today become seeds of your new creation planted in the needs of the world you love, watered by tears and hope, fed and strengthened by the glow of Christ's resurrection, gathered home with joy and singing. Amen. charge to you as you live this next week is to be available to others to listen for that is the way that God heals it's by bringing listening people into our lives 
Now may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord be gracious and kind to you. May the Lord's face be upon you and grant you peace.